welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and I'm really looking forward to another individual study with you today focused on Paul Vario and his enormous Canarsie crew. Vario and his crew have been the inspiration for many books and movies so as you can imagine we have much to discuss so let's get right to it. Paul Vario was born on July 10th 1914 in Brooklyn, New York. He had four brothers, Vito, Salvatore, Thomas, and Leonard. His first criminal offense came at age 11 for truancy, for which he served seven months in juvenile detention. He would be arrested in 1931 at age 16 for breaking into a garage and stealing tires. In 1938, when Vario was 23, he raped an 18-year-old girl. All of this was just the beginning. Over his lifetime, his rap sheet would come to include three burglaries, three rapes, grand larceny, assault, operation of an unregistered still, two bribery charges, unlawful flight, failure to purchase a gambling tax stamp, bookmaking, drunk driving, two counts of loan sharking, four counts of civil contempt, hijacking, interstate theft, seven criminal contempt of court cases, two counts of income tax evasion, witness tampering, insurance fraud, obstruction of justice, conspiracy, defrauding the federal government, fraud, racketeering, and extortion. Someone in the comments correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that he has the longest rap sheet of any criminal that we've seen on this channel so far. It's not surprising that a man like Paul Vario ended up with a Martin Scorsese character based off of him. In the movie Goodfellas, the character Paul Cicero, played by Paul Servino, is based on Paul Vario. Vario was married twice, first to Vita Vario, with whom he had three sons, Peter, Paul Jr., and Leonard, and later he was married to Phyllis Vario. It was with his wife Phyllis Vario that we get the infamous story of the couple dining at Don Pepe's Vesuvio restaurant on Leftert's Boulevard, a restaurant still in business today. Feeling snubbed after doctors were seated before them, when they were finally seated, the maitre d' spilled wine on Phyllis's dress and dabbed a dirty rag all over her body to dry up the mess causing Paul Vario to come unglued. He punched the maitre d' who ran into the kitchen. The restaurant staff attempted to hold Vario off, but he left and returned with backup. According to one of his crewmen, Henry Hill's testimony, we were chasing waiters and breaking heads all over Brooklyn that night. Paul Vario was a big man, six foot tall and 240 pounds, who had an unkempt appearance. Vulgar and ill-mannered, he was known for his unstoppable temper. Apparently, he was actually slow to anger, but once he got there, it was impossible to stop him. Another example of Vario's temper came during the funeral of his son, Leonard Vario. Leonard Vario, who was 23 years old, died as a result of burns that he sustained on July 20th, 1973. The circumstances around this death still remain a mystery today. Leonard Vario's charred body, over 90% of which was covered in burns, was left outside the Wyckoff Heights Hospital, seemingly from an explosion six blocks away at Vic Construction Company, the cause of which was determined to be arson. According to the district attorney's spokesman, Leonard Vario, even in death, refused to explain what had happened to him. Even as he was dying, the spokesman said, he wouldn't say a thing. During Leonard Vario's funeral, local camera crews began setting up their equipment to film the procession. Paul Vario's men left their limousines to attack the camera crews and smash their equipment. The men not only injured the cameramen, but also the detectives on surveillance duty for the funeral. While many of Vario's qualities would not serve you well on a normal resume, he was well respected within the Lucchese family and rose quickly in the ranks. Starting as a soldier, moving quickly into the capo position, at which point he would induct his brothers into the family. By the early 1970s, he would even take on the role of acting consigliere for Lucchese boss, Carmine Tremonti. Vario was probably most famous for his enormous Canarsie crew. During the 1960s and 1970s, Vario ran the largest Lucchese crew, if not the largest Cosa Nostra crew, in the city. This crew would swell to encompass several neighborhoods in Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and Staten Island. Nicholas Pileggi described Vario's crew as one of the city's toughest and most violent gangs. It would take probably the length of this entire episode to go through every single one of the men in the Canarsie crew. Even if I were to go through the top men with you, it would take a really long time. If you've seen Goodfellas, the Martin Scorsese film, then you probably already know that we're going to be covering at least two of these members, Thomas DeSimone and Henry Hill. More on them in a little bit. Vario owned or was associated with several legitimate businesses in which his men would meet or illegal activities would take place. At the time of several arrests, he claimed to be a florist. One particular flower shop, the Fountain Blue Florist, is said to have been one of the main flower suppliers for mafia funerals. Other businesses included nightclubs. His discos were among the most popular during the 1970s and 1980s. One of the music venues that he owned, My Father's Place, would host musicians such as Billy Joel, Madonna, Bruce Springsteen, The Police, Tom Petty, Blondie, and Aerosmith, among others. He also owned bars and restaurants and used car lots. His most notable criminal activity sprang from his junkyards and his taxi services. 
In 1965, Vario and two of his brothers were arrested after attempting to set up illegal gambling operations of floating, chauffeured dice games with his taxi services. In 1966, he would be charged with bribery, illegal gambling, and conspiracy. Between 1967 and 1968, he would be indicted for a $30 million per year bookmaking scheme. Vario's junk and scrap metal yards were his primary headquarters and where the biggest plans for his crew were hatched. Before the junkyard headquarters, it was believed that his associate, James Burke, more on him soon, allowed the crew to be headquartered at his bar, Robert's Lounge, from 1957 up into the 1970s. It is from a junkyard trailer that Vario oversaw hijackings, loan sharking, and bookmaking operations, fencing stolen property, and extorting money from shippers and airlines in exchange for labor peace at the Kennedy Airport. The extortion of the JFK Airport is not Vario's most famous run-in with airlines, however. I mentioned before that two of Vario's most famous associates were Thomas DeSimone and Henry Hill. Thomas DeSimone was first introduced to Capo Paul Vario in 1965, when he was only 15 years old. He would begin working under Vario and Henry Hill, who was in his early 20s at the time, on hijacking, fencing, extortion, and even murder. In April of 1967, however, he and Hill would participate in the heist that made them famous, the Air France robbery. All right, if you've seen Goodfellas, you might not need much information on the Air France robbery, but for those of you who haven't seen it or need a refresher, let's dig into this a little bit. Air France was an American currency carrier contracted to bring cash into the United States that had been exchanged for local currency in Southeast Asia. This cash, which had been transported in linen bags, came to the United States at a rate of about a million dollars per week and would be stored in a locked cement block vault with a round-the-clock security guard. The guard was the only person with the key to this vault and he would have it on his person at all times. Robert McMahon, the Canarsie crew's inside man at JFK, let Hill know the breakdown of the situation and that a few men with pistols would be able to take the money if the money was still in the strong room. Because of this big if, the crew decided that it would be better if they could steal the money instead of worrying about the fuss and mess that would come from a stick up. It would be easier to just walk in, take a detour, open the strong room, and steal the cash by putting it in suitcases. They could get by with this because many people were walking in and out for lost and found luggage. There were still two obstacles that remained with this plan, however. The first one was how to get the guard out of the way, and the second one was how to open the door without the guard's key. McMahon let Hill and DeSimone know that the guard took a meal break just before midnight, so when they did move forward with the robbery, they should plan it around this time. So this eliminated the first obstacle, but it didn't eliminate the second one. They still needed that key in order to get into the strong room. McMahon introduced the guard to an escort, with whom the guard became intimate. It took some planning and a few tries, but eventually Hill was able to swipe the key while the guard was with the escort. Unlike in the movie, however, Hill made a copy of the key to use for the heist. McMahon got word and shared the news about the next cash delivery date of Friday, April 7th, 1967, with the Canarsie crew. And at 11.40 p.m. that night, the men made their move, walking straight into the strong room with the second key and shoving $420,000 into their suitcases and walking away without so much as a hiccup. The robbery wouldn't even be discovered until the next day. Now, continuing on our airline heist theme, James Burke, an Irish associate with Barrio's crew, is believed to be the mastermind behind the December 11th, 1978 Lufthansa heist at the John F. Kennedy Airport, in which $5 million in cash and $875,000 in jewelry were stolen, with the help of Henry Hill, Thomas DeSimone, and others, making it the largest robbery committed in the U.S. at that time. Burke was never charged for this case. In fact, Louis Werner, an airport worker who helped facilitate this heist, was the only person who was ever charged, and the money and jewelry were never recovered. Burke and Hill would also work together on a huge drug operation that included amphetamines, heroin, and cocaine. Hill would be busted on this cocaine operation in 1980 and turn prosecution witness against his former boss and his associates. He would then enter the witness protection program. But before we get into the fallout of Hill's betrayal, let's talk a little bit more about Vario and his history with law enforcement. In 1970, Vario was in prison for nine months for contempt of a grand jury, then was indicted again soon after his release for bribery and drunk driving. In 1971, he was indicted for the evasion of $39,900 in taxes from gambling profit. He would also be indicted for corrupting prison guards as he bribed them to bring women and liquor and drugs to himself and his associates in jail. In 1972, Vario's trailer headquarters was bugged, and the FBI was able to tie him to a hijacking charge that consisted of the robbery of a delivery truck filled with $44,000 worth of women's slacks. 
His junkyard would be raided in 1972, and that's when the walls really began to come crashing down on Barrio. He was indicted for witness tampering after he had advised one of his associates to flee to Florida to avoid testifying before a grand jury. In order to capture Vario for this arrest, a high-speed car chase ensued in Brooklyn for 20 minutes. Vario was indicted for insurance fraud as well after sinking his own boat, and in the same year he was charged with attempting to bribe an officer in his trailer headquarters. He would also plead guilty to drunk driving and receive a probation, but he violated that probation in 1973 and went to jail. This 1972 bugging would result in the serving of over six hundred subpoenas. Paul Vario was convicted of tax evasion charges and sentenced to six years in prison and fined $20,000 on April 6th, 1973. Vario was released from prison on parole in 1975. Upon Paul Vario's release, Carmine Tremonti was no longer the boss of the Lucchese family, and Vario lost his position of what was essentially a hybrid role of consigliere and underboss. Anthony Corallo was now the boss of the family, and Vario moved to Florida. It was here that he gave the green light for that 1978 Lufthansa heist. And he would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for that chatty associate. In 1980, Vario was the head of a car theft ring that specialized in stealing specifically Cadillacs and reselling them at lots for low prices. 1980 was also the year that Henry Hill was arrested for his cocaine charges, and he would turn against his associates and boss before going into the witness protection program. In 1984, Hill testified that Barrio had helped him receive an early release from jail by providing him with a fake job as a waiter for parole purposes. On April 3rd, 1984, Barrio was sentenced to four years in federal prison and made to pay a $10,000 fine. While in prison in 1985, due to more of Hill's testimony, Vario was convicted and sentenced to 10 years for the extortion of $350,000 from the John F. Kennedy International Airport cargo companies, the scheme in which he would threaten labor disputes if he did not receive payment. Vario is reported to have controlled several unions throughout his life, including Local Number 66, the Commissary Food Workers Union in Long Island. Paul Vario would die on May 3, 1988, in Fort Worth Federal Prison in Fort Worth, Texas, as a result of lung failure due to lung cancer at the age of 73. He was buried at St. John's Cemetery in Middle Village, Queens. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the infamous Paul Vario. Vario became a household name after the release of the Goodfellas movie, but this refresher and investigation into his life was certainly educational for me, and I hope it was for you as well. Don't forget to let me know in the comments below or on Facebook or Twitter who you would like for me to cover next. I love seeing who you're interested in knowing more about, and I am always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.